My name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on OCRA chromatography and qualitative analysis. Now this video goes through um, the qualitative analysis and chromatography topic um, or chromatography and qualitative analysis topic um, in detail and it goes through, um, when I say in detail it means it looks at the OCR specification um, in particular. Um, so it means that if you are studying OCR chemistry then um, this video is perfect for you because it contains everything that you need to know for this specification and it doesn't contain it doesn't contain additional stuff which you're thinking well will this be on the specification will it not so everything in here has been designed for OCR uh, and I do have a wide range of videos for OCR as well on my Allery Chemistry YouTube channel um, there's a full range of stuff on there from revision videos to uh, whiteboard videos showing uh, uh, basic uh, going into a little bit more detail uh, with my whiteboard board videos but also have exam technique videos as well where I work through um, an exam paper and go through the, the technique side as well so have a look on Allery Chemistry they're all for free so please subscribe and show your support um, and for as long as I can do it um, they will remain free at all times so you can access them whenever you want um, the slides if you would like to purchase the slides um, these slides that I'm using here then you can do if you click on the link in the description box um, below then you'll be able to get them there they're really good value for money and they're great for revising on the go on your tablet and your smartphone so please download them um, and get them uh, uh, and get them as part of your revision uh, your revision mix as well okay so like I say this video is going to go through uh, the the parts of uh, this this topic and it does meet the specification as you can see uh, on the screen here so um, we've got types of chromatography, we're going to look at organic functional uh, group tests as well, look at chemical tests because that's your qualitative analysis. So a lot of this is to do with analysis and this kind of pulls together some of the uh, concepts that you've already seen at, um, at A level all the way through all your organic reactions and this is looking at the tests for them. So what can we do to verify or justify that these chemicals that we've made do contain this functional group and we're going to look at um, obviously chromatography like we say as well and, and a, a chromatography that you may not have seen before um, in terms of at GCSE you would have seen paper chromatography which is obviously a type of chromatography this one we're going to look at a bit more of a um, complicated version of that <coughs> okay but we'll come into that in a moment so let's look at our chemical tests first so we're going to test for alkenes um, I've got a, a bit of a joke. <laughs> um, why are why are Geordies so good at chemistry? Because they're all keen. Yeah, um, <laughs> that was uh, that's terrible. That, that's just because I, I I live near Newcastle, so so that's uh, yeah. Anyway, right next. Um, so the test for alkenes involves reacting it with bromine water, um, and so we add bromine water to an alkene. Um, so if we think we've got an alkene, we add bromine water to it, um, and then we shake it. <laughs> That's the extent to our animative skills. So we shake the test tube, as you can see there, um, and then if an alkene is present, it goes colourless. Um, so an alkene, or any if there's a double bond within there, so it might be um, it might be a long hydrocarbon chain, but if it has a double bond, the bromine will add onto that there. So it's actually reacting with that double bond, and the colourless solution in this case is going to be a dibromoalkane. Because the bromine adds onto the onto the alkene, so this is a um, an addition reaction. Okay, so how do we test for haloalkanes? So testing for haloalkanes um, is is using silver nitrate, and we confirm this with ammonia. Okay, and you'll see how this works. And I've got a diagram here to show you, and you might have done this practical as well. And if you have, you'll know it's really difficult to distinguish between the colours. So ammonia is used, but we'll go into the detail now. So if we're testing for chloride, bromide, and iodide ions, which are formed from haloalkanes, then we add dilute nitric acid to it, which is HNO3, um, and then we add silver nitrate solution, which is AgNO3, uh, and the colour of the precipitate will help you to identify that halide ion. And you can see the diagram there, um, or the diagram, the picture there, shows the tests of each different chemical. So we're going to go through them each. So chloride ions. So chloride ions, if there's chloride ions present, then we will see a white precipitate that's formed. And that white precipitate is actually silver chloride because it's the silver ions reacting with the chloride ions in that solution uh, and that's forming silver chloride solid. 
Bromide ions form a cream precipitate, as you can see. The colours are very, very similar, as you can see. Um, so they form a cream precipitate. Um, and the cream precipitate is silver bromide that's been formed, as you can see there. So there's AGBR solid. Um, iodide ions form a yellow precipitate. So um, that's Ag plus, I minus, and AGI. And what we've got to do as well, um, because the problem with problem with this is that yes, okay, you'll get your precipitates caused by the iodide uh, caused by the um, halide ions. However, there are other impurities in there that can also react with your um, halide ion. That uh, sorry, that can also react with your silver nitrate that can produce a uh, cloudy precipitate. So to get rid of this, we add nitric acid. Um, and that gets rid of other um, impurities such as uh, carbonates, which could give you a false, a false, a false test. So, like I said, because the colours are so similar to each other, um, then we need a further test really to confirm this. And we add ammonia solution to the precipitate. So, if we add ammonia solution to the chloride ion test, um, if we add dilute ammonia, then the white precipitate should dissolve. If we add dilute ammonia to any of the other ones, it won't dissolve. If we add um, concentrated ammonia to the bromide test tube, then it will dissolve. And if we add um, the concentrated ammonia to the iodide one at the end here, so this one here. So if we add concentrated ammonia to that, that won't dissolve. Um, the yellow precipitate here of the silver iodide is insoluble in concentrated ammonia. So um, it won't dissolve at all, even if we add concentrated ammonia. Um, also, the fluoride ions, you might think, well, where's, where's fluoride gone? Um, fluoride ions doesn't even form a precipitate um, when on reaction with silver nitrate because the silver fluoride that's formed is actually soluble, so it dissolves readily anyway. So we don't see any tests, so that's why um, it doesn't have any value in terms of testing. But you just might, just for interest, you might want to know where the F- minus has gone. Okay, so how do we test for phenols? So phenols can be identified using two tests, which effectively utilize that weak acid nature of phenols. Remember, a phenol is classed as a, as a weak acid because it has it can dissociate slightly and produce that H plus ion. So first, phenols react with strong bases such as sodium hydroxide because they are because they're an acid. So if a phenol or acid exists, now this is the downside because it could be any acid, the solid dissolves to form a colorless salt. Okay, um, so I've spelled that wrong, so I should say colourless. Uh, so if phenol doesn't exist, then I, it's not acidic, then we don't get any reaction at all. Secondly, we can now test the sample with a weaker base, such as a carbonate. Um, now we must do this second test, we must do this second test as the one above doesn't conclude it's definitely phenol, as we said. So carbonates will only react with strong acids. So if a phenol or base does exist, um, if a phenol does exist, then there's no visible reaction. But if a phenol doesn't exist, i.e. if it's a strong acid, then we do see fizzing or effervescence of carbon dioxide gas. So we've just got to make sure that we are, um, you know, that we're doing these two tests. We test one first to make sure there is an acid in the first place and then react it with the carbonate just to confirm that um, if it doesn't fizz, then that's a good sign. That means it is a, is a phenol. Okay, so let's look at tests for carboxylic acids. So carboxylic acids involves reacting with a carbonate, very similar to the phenol reaction that we've seen before. So the practical setup is this. So we react it with a carbonate, which is here, and that reacts with H plus ions that we get from the um, um, ethanoic acid or whatever carboxylic acid we're using. And we're going to get carbon dioxide and water that's being formed. Um, and also... Um, also a salt, but this is just the ionic equation that we're looking at. So carboxylic acids react with carbonates. They make carbon dioxide gas when it's bubbled. Um, and when it's bubbled through lime water, it actually goes cloudy. So you might have seen this reaction before. Um, the test for carbon dioxide is using lime water. It goes from colorless to cloudy. So a suitable carbonate to use would be sodium carbonate um, um, or even sodium carbonate solution would be fine, anything like that. Um, but what we've got to be careful of this doesn't conclusively say that it's definitely a carboxylic acid is that any other acid will react in the same way so you have to know 
Um, so you have to have a range of um, different ways in which you can measure, measure um, a carboxylic acid, such as a spectrometry or spectroscopy. And we can use um, other instruments, analytical techniques to determine that. As you've just seen before, phenol is not a carboxylic acid, but it will react with the carbonate because it's a weak acid. So you've got to be careful. Okay, so how do we test for the carbonyl group? So Brady's reagent, which is 2,4-DNPH or 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine, can be used to test this carbonyl group. Uh, and it works in a very simple way that Brady's reagent um, is dissolved in concentrated sulfuric acid and methanol. It's then added to the substance that we're actually testing. Um, and if a carbonyl um, group exists, then we get a bright orange precipitate. Um, and then that the reason why this works is because Brady's reagent only reacts with the carbonyl group in aldehydes and ketones. It doesn't react with the one in carboxylic acids. So this is actually quite a good test to prove that we do have a carbonyl group and it distinguishes it between that and a carboxylic acid. And then what we do, um, the precipitate that we form um, is actually a derivative of the carbonyl compound that we've actually um, tested. So this means that depending on what aldehyde or ketone we had there will depend on what type of um, precipitate we form. And because each precipitate is unique, what we can do is actually determine the melting point of the powder that we formed, and then we can compare that with a known library of melting points, a known uh, library of known melting points. Um, and that can help us to actually identify what aldehyde or ketone we had. So that's, um, that's pretty cool. Okay, so... How do we actually distinguish between aldehyde and ketones? So we know that um, Brady's reagent identifies the um, carbonyl group, but it doesn't distinguish between an aldehyde and a ketone. So Tollens' reagent actually does this. So Tollens um, can be made, we've got to understand how we make Tollens first. So this can be made um, first, and we do it by adding silver nitrate solution into a test tube, and this is a colorless solution. We then add a few drops of sodium hydroxide. Um, this turns it pale brown and you get the slight precipitate being formed. And then we have to add a few drops of dilute ammonia until that precipitate dissolves. And here we have just made our Tollens reagent. And we then use that Tollens reagent and add it to our sample. Now that could be an aldehyde or it could be a ketone. It depends on what it is. But we add the aldehyde or ketone to the Tollens reagent. We put it into a water bath. We don't use... We don't use a Bunsen burner because um, if we um, if, if the aldehyde and ketone is flammable and if we use a naked flame on that, then um, we could have a fire risk. So we always use a water bath, a hot water bath to get that going. Um, and then what you see is that if you have an aldehyde, because al effectively this is an oxidizing agent. So if you have an aldehyde, the aldehyde can be oxidized to a carboxylic acid, but the, the result is we get a silver lining around your test tube. It's really nice and we call it a silver mirror test. So we get a silver lining with an aldehyde and with a ketone. Ketones can't be oxidized, so and um, we get no precipitate whatsoever. So that's a way in which we can distinguish if we've got an aldehyde or a ketone. Okay, so how do we test for alcohols? So acidified potassium dichromate, or K2Cr2O7, can be used to distinguish between primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. So acidified potassium dichromate oxidizes primary and secondary alcohols but not tertiary alcohols so remember tertiary alcohols cannot be oxidized so primary and secondary alcohols so just looking at these two about how we distinguish these two because we know the tertiary nothing will happen with the tertiary so these are oxidized by using acidified potassium dichromate uh, solution which is k2cr2o7 and this itself is a mild oxidizing agent um, and so therefore is reduced itself and so this means it will turn from this orange, this um, kind of like uh, bright orange color, which is Cr2, O7, 2 minus, and um, which is your dichromate ion, and it will go um, to green, which is your chromium ion, Cr3 plus. Um, so you'll get a color change. So if if um, something has been uh, reduced, uh, sorry, if, if something's been oxidized, then we see this color change from orange to green. So tertiary alcohols, remember, can't be oxidized using dichromates at all, so we can just ignore that. So the problem lies with primary and secondary alcohols is they both give the same color change because both of them can be oxidized. So what we have to do is use fractional distillation, and we can see that shown on the right there, to collect the products 
upon oxidation. And then what we can do is test the product to see if an aldehyde or ketone is formed. So the first thing we need to do is heat that up, distill it, get our first product, and then test it for aldehyde or ketone. So remember, an aldehyde is made from a primary alcohol and a ketone is made from a secondary alcohol. So we know that if it's an aldehyde, um, aldehyde is in there, then we know we've had a primary alcohol and we know if it's a ketone in there, we've had a secondary alcohol. Okay, so let's look at moving to chromatography now. So there's all our uh, chemical tests. So this is a qualitative analysis where we can use wet lab tests, they call it, um, where you use um, chemicals to test for a functional group, which is fine, but it has its limitations. Um, and we can use other analytical techniques, and you'll see it in this one and in the next video, um, which is looking into NMR um, and mass spectrometry and combining them all together. But this is one part uh, which is called uh, chromatography. So we look at the first one, which is TLC. It's not tender love and care, although chemistry is, of course. Um, this is called thin layer chromatography, of course. So it allows us to separate and identify compounds, which is which is vitally useful. So TLC uses a stationary phase, and you would have seen this. This is like we do in year seven, you know, it's 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 pretty straightforward stuff, but obviously we're dealing with more complicated chemicals here. So but anyway, TLC uses a stationary phase of silica or alumina mounted on a glass or metal plate. Now you might have seen something similar, not TLC, but you would have seen something similar using paper. Um, so you would have used filter paper instead. But this is this is a little bit more technical because we're using different chemicals, as I said. But we draw a pencil line is drawn at the bottom and drops of mixture are added towards the bottom. And you can see here that um, we have it in a, in a glass beaker. We have our solvent, which is the mobile phase towards the bottom. So this is a liquid solvent. So mobile phase is anything which moves with the um, anything which moves with the uh, moves either from the bottom to the top or moves through a pipe. You'll see another example of uh, chromatography, but a mobile phase is, is something that moves and a stationary phase is something that remains static as it, as it, as it, as it suggests there. So this is the stationary phase because this is obviously, um, uh, this is not moving. It's the liquid that will migrate up the, up the stationary phase. So the substance sticks to the stationary phase and the mobile phase carries it through. And um, we put a glass lid on as well, um, and this stops any um, any solvents from evaporating out of there. We want to try and keep the solvents in here and rising up the rising up the stationary phase. So what we do is we place the plate in the solvent. The baseline must be above the solvent level. That's very 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 important. If it's not, then it won't work. And we leave until the solvent has moved up near the top of the plate, and we remove and mark the solvent front. And allow it to dry okay so as soon as that's done you'll find you'll see a line like a solvent line appear at the top depending on where the solvent has risen up to we remove it and draw that line on there so we know where that line is so it works by the mixture spots so the spots there dissolving in the solvent some of the chemicals in the mixture may not dissolve as much and will actually stick to the stationary phase quite quickly um, but what we're left with is actually the chromatogram and so what we'll see is then these dots or these ink dots will will appear at different places on here depending on how well they actually dissolve in the mobile phase and what we can do is we can actually identify the chemicals what chemicals we've got in here because these are mixtures remember so we don't know what you know what chemicals are in here but we can identify them using the positions on the chromatogram that we that we have left so this is how we can do it and we can identify it using something called an RF value from a chromatogram. So the number of spots on the plate tells you how many chemicals make up the mixture. Okay, so for example, if you've got three chemicals in the mixture, you should see three spots in your chromatogram. So that's fairly straightforward. And these can be identified by calculating the RF value and comparing these to a library of known RF values. So let's have a look as an example. So you can see here, this is our chromatogram that we've whipped out of the um, out of the beaker, and we have our baseline. That's where that's where we started from. That's where the ink spot started from, or whatever chemical you're using. It's not ink, but it could be anything. It could be ink. It could be anything. Um, we have our solvent front that we drawn in at the top. So that was the highest. That was where the solvent went up to. Um, and then here's the spot. The spot has migrated up the chromatogram. So. What we do is we calculate RF by doing distance traveled by the spot, which is in the red, 
and distance travelled by the solvent, which is in the purple. And we divide the distance travelled by the spot by the solvent. So RF values are fixed for each chemical, okay, so that's important. However, this changes if the temperature of the solvent or the makeup of the TLC plate changes. So depends on what the stationary phase, phase is made from, the mobile phase and obviously the temperature will have an impact. So it's very important, and this is the same with anything in science, that you keep, you have your... Um, your independent variables, they must keep, they must be, uh, must remain the same, and the dependent variables are the ones which you change. So it's very important to keep as many things the same and just change one thing at a time. Uh, and that means you can make comparisons between them and, and come up with valid results and draw valid conclusions as well. Okay, so let's look at this one. This is what I mentioned before, where um, this is a different, this is still chromatography, but it's a different type of chromatography, and actually it's quite specialized area. Um, and it can be quite useful. So this is called gas chromatography. So gas chromatography, or GC, is used to separate mixtures of liquids that are volatile, and hence um, they can be identified. So this is quite important. So it's mainly used, mainly used for separation, but we can identify, we can identify it as well. So a gas, gas chromatography uh, looks like this. This is the equipment. They're quite big bits of equipment, and they'll sit on a on a on a bench. Um, but this is the diagram version here. So in gas chromatography, what we have is a very thin column that is wound up inside an oven to save space. Okay, so because these things are really, really long. So we, we squash it all into an oven. And the column is lined with a solid or viscous liquid. That could be an oil. And that acts as the stationary phase. Okay, so that should be an A. That's not spelled. So stationary with an E is stationary is in pens and paper. Stationary with an A is actually not moving so this should be an A so I'll get that changed so this is a stationary phase so um, you can see here here's the column here it's wound up in this oven here it's a very thin wire and it's lined with your um, with uh, like a like an oil like a very viscous liquid that's your stationary phase the sample is injected into the machine and carried by an inert gas so this is normally nitrogen um, and it, which is the mobile phase so we can see here our nitrogen store is in here, and that is our flow gas, and then our sample is actually injected in here. But the gas is whizzing through here, and it's going to pick up that uh, sample that we've injected and carry it through the column. Each substance takes a different amount of time to travel through the column and reach the detector. So the length of time it takes is called the retention time. So just like with the TLC um, system that you've all set up that you've seen before um, there is a time difference between some some uh, chemicals spend more time in the stationary phase some spend um, less time in the stationary phase and actually get um, and dissolve well in the mobile phase um, and so basically it's like a race so we're putting the, all the chemicals in at once but the chemicals there's a mixture of chemicals in there some of them will take ages to get through that column and some will actually um, will get through pretty quickly and we call that a retention time. So it's how long the chemicals have been retained in that column. So the time it takes for the sample to travel through varies. Um, so like I say, some spend more time on the stationary phase. Um, and some spend um, more time traveling in the mobile phase. And what we get is a chromatogram at the end. And this comes out here. And that's what we're going to look at as well. So we've got a chromatogram. This is our GC spectra. Um, and so this shows uh, peaks of varying sizes and they're appearing at different times because of that retention time that we've just been talking about. So each peak in the spectra represents a different substance and each substance has a different retention time. So the retention time, as you can see, is just the difference between the peak of, of, of one, um, of one uh, peak that's at the top of one peak and zero. And what we can do is we can compare the retention times with the library of known uh, substance times to identify what is in our mixture. The area under the peak tells us the amount of each substance. So the larger the peak, the um, the larger the area under the peak, and um, the more substance we have. So you can see whatever this substance is here, um, we've got most of this. We've got a lot of this in our mixture. and We've got not much of this here, very little of this, and this is the second amount. So whatever this is, we know that we can actually measure its abundance as well from the height of the peak, so that's pretty, that's pretty good. 
So gas chromatography is also used to detect the amount of alcohol in urine and blood, uh, and that can be used as evidence in court. Um, so the results have um, have got to be reliable. If you're going to uh, hold somebody accountable for their actions and prove it, then you've got to have confidence in the equipment they're using. So um, gas chromatography is really useful for that. Um, and for example, blood samples. So um, that's effectively what we use to uh, analyze um, if it's blood samples, if it's drugs, drugs in the blood uh, or alcohol levels. So it is really useful. Um, and it can also be used to identify volatile compounds in paints, such as esters. And this is useful for restoration experts. So when you get a, um, a, a bit of art and you're not sure on the actual date of it, um, you know, they use different pigments and paints depending on the era they were painting in. Um, and um, art um, restoration experts or art historians can take samples, light samples of the paint, analyze it and work out, you know, what, what, uh, composition is that paint made from and that can help date the painting so so there is a lot of use here with these types of equipment okay so we use a calibration curve um, to measure the concentration of a substance tested via gas chromatography and you might have seen calibration curves before so first of all what we have to do is plot a calibration curve uh, and this is created by making up a range of known different concentrations of the sample solution the area under each peak is measured for each one and the results plotted. Okay, so this is what we've got here. So we've got the area in units, whatever the units are of the peak and the concentration here. But these are the known concentrations. So we've we've done this deliberately and we've, we've effectively set a standard. So we make samples by diluting the different concentrations of the sample under the test. Um, we must use the same substance and solvent as the one to be tested, exactly the same to make it comparable. And we use a pipette to ensure accurate volumes are measured. So we do this um, and we, um, we draw a graph, as you can see on there, our calibration curve. So we then test the sample that we want to, what, what we want to know more about, um, and we want to know the concentration of it. And we do that by measuring the area under the peak of our sample. And then what we do is we then go back to our calibration curve um, and um, we use the area that we've got on our sample chromatogram to work out the concentration of the substance that we want to know what's in there. So, for example, um, we've plotted our graph, we've analysed our substance, we know we get our chromatogram, we measure the height and uh, the area, sorry, under that chromatogram. We go back to our graph, we plot it on there, and we say, right, okay, we've got 0.43, let's say 0.43 moles per dm cubed of this substance in our sample. So normally what we do is run a blank containing all the reagents and solvents, but no analyte. Um, so, and we measure the peaks against this to ensure the results are caused due to the analyte and not to other substances. So the um, that's really important because we are adding solvents in here and there might be other impurities here. So normally we just run blank samples to ensure that if there are any changes, then it is caused by our analyte and not by anything else. Okay, so... As seen previously, we can identify molecules using retention times, and there's a few factors that affect these. This is just the final, the final point on gas chromatography. <clears throat> so there's three things. First one is solubility. So the solubility of the substance determines the retention time. Okay. Um, so if the substance is highly soluble um, in the in the mobile phase, so um, you know as it's as it's being moved through, then um, then the retention time will be smaller and likewise if it's less soluble it'll spend more time in the solid stationary phase um, and I'd have a higher retention time so the 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 solubility is, is an important factor and is really the, the biggest determinant of um, of, of uh, gas uh, retention time should I say uh, the next one is temperature of the actual machine itself remember that coil is wrapped up in an oven so the warmer the machine the more time the substance will remain in the evaporated state and so that means it'll move the move through the tube much quicker. So um, the retention times will be shorter. So the temperature of the oven is is vital here. And the final one is boiling point. So if the substance has a really high boiling point, then it's more likely to travel through the tube as a liquid rather than a gas. And this means it'll take longer to get through there. And so therefore the retention time will be a lot higher if the um, if the boiling point is is higher of the substance that we're testing. 
Okay, and that's it. So that's your uh, roundup of qualitative analysis. So that's how we test things and chromatography. Like I say, there's a full range of videos on allergy chemistry. Please subscribe to the channel. Um, I massively appreciate it um, just to show you support. But there's a full range for most, um, for, well, for a good range of um, uh, 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 AQA exam boards. So not just OCR, but there's a, there's a full range there. So just go and have a look. Um, more stuff's being added all the time. And like I say, if you want a copy of these slides, um, then um, click on the link below and you can purchase them from my, uh, from my test shop. But that's it. Okay, bye-bye.